All right, so it's Ephesians, Ephesians, um, Ephesians chapter 4 and 14, where it says that we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So that the prayer of the apostle was that we would become mature. So when you read in the Bible and it says, be perfect, that more correctly and more properly and contextually understood is become mature. Let us become mature in and through these teachings of his majesty and, and the teachings and the study of the word. And this was under the point uh, purposes of the ministry gifts for the perfecting of the Kedusan, the holy ones, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christos or the hypostasis, the body, all of us collectively as one body, like Israel in Exodus is referred to as Jah's son. As he says, um, I've called my son. That Israel, the, 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 the people, the collective, us as a corporate, as a corporate entity. Now there's some legal um, mumble jumble out there in the world that's kind of interesting because some of the legal mumble jumble that we find actually speaks about how corporations, like how a corporation is viewed as a person. But where do they get that from? Scripturally. Scripturally here, the church is viewed as a corporate body, as a corporate structure. So all of us individually coming together are as one man or one person or one church or one bride even in, in the revelations in the sense of, in the sense of revelation. Now, it goes on to say that till we all come in the unity, until we all come to the, the unity of the faith, the unity of the faith. That's an important point right there. And of the knowledge. So there's a, there's a, the scripture is showing us that we all are to come to a particular level a particular maturity, and that maturity is the unity of the faith and of the knowledge, the knowledge or the scientia, the science or the knowledge of the Bain Ha Elohim, the Son of God, to a perfect man, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature and the fullness of Christos or of Christ, the Moshiach. And this to us in Rastafari Revelation has been vouchsafed and verified um, and revealed in the person of Kedamawi Hal Selassie, one who is walking in that, 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 that measure of the stature and the fullness in spirit and in truth of Christ as, as a testimony that the way of the Moshiach, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That that is the key. That He says, I am the door. He is the door to this 2012. He is the true door to this 2012, if they only knew. It says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, every kind of teaching. Oh, someone so said such and such. But if we are looking at the big picture and if we see the vision, either it fits in the vision or either it does not. And if it fits, where does it fit? You understand? Otherwise, it's just a wind of doctrine, a wind like a breeze of teaching. You understand? And it's by slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, we've got to speak the truth in love. And this is very interesting because His Majesty in the Lutheran interview, he also speaks on these, these main simple but very important elemental point, speaking the truth in love and the importance of love when it is based on the true love of God in Christ. Speaking the truth in love may grow up, may grow up. So there is 
a growth, a growing process, even to true Christian and true Christian, now, there is a grow, there's, there's, a, there's a growth process. It's very clear. But this is not what we see demonstrated in counterfeit or worldly Christianity. That we don't see speaking the truth in love. We don't see ones acting like grown-ups may grow up to him in all things, not some things. You know, not some things, but in all, in all things. May grow up to him in all things, which is the head, which is the ras, which is the, the ritis, which is the head, even Christ, even Moshiach, even the Mashiach, even the anointed Christ in his kingly character, from whom the whole body, from whom the whole body, so all of us as as different families, different brethren, different sisterin, different even mansions in Rastafari and among our Ethiopian Hebrew diaspora, that it says that the that from whom and now it's from the Ras. It is from the Ras. It is from the Christ. Christ in his kingly character, from whom the whole body, us as the hypostasis, the Akal, the Akala Christos fitly joined together, properly fit, properly fitting, properly joining together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. So every joint, each joining is supplying the family. This is why we did the, the, did the teaching on the um, call and what is our call and to recognize our call and, to, and to, to, as the Bible says, stay in the calling which we are called. You understand, each of us has been given skills that we might not think are important to his kingdom because we still must come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Bain Ha Elohim or the Son of God, our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua Ha Moshiach. So here it says that according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body to the edifying of itself. So as we increase, as we come in that unity of the true faith, as we come in that unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, therefore the, the, the uniting, so it's not because we're looking at the time and saying, oh, we got to do it like a, no, it is according to his will because we are making our wills individually and then collectively you understand, making our wills obedient to good influences. And therefore, there is increase of the body. There is increase of the true church of Rastafari to the edifying, to the building up of itself. So the church it builds itself up in, and here's the key, in love, in his love, because it's that God, Jah, is love. It doesn't say that love is Jah, but Jah is the true love. And therefore, we first think, we first have to put first, first, first. You understand? We have to put first, first, and everything else, you understand, will come into its proper, its proper context. Now, this portion of scripture right here, this is a little bit, a little bit, um, not off from this, but it's connected because it's saying, well, where are we right now? in this time of revelation? Where are we right now in spiritual Egypt? How do we get to the next level of preparation? How do we prepare ourselves? We must re recall even that the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians is a very important book in many ways, and we don't want to just go into that right now, but let's just get to this next part, the walk of the Mitmanon as a new man in Christ. Yes. Now, it's interesting when you read the New Testament that much of Hawari of Alos's, Paul's writing and Paul's teaching and his sermons for different churches and different mitmanon, the different faithful ones in his time, he, he pointed out certain um, correspondences to Moses, certain correspondences as well to the Exodus. I think is in the same book right here where... Um, he mentions when we look at let's look at Moses in the New Testament for for example. 
if we look at Moses in the New Testament, um, it mentions, let's take uh, Corinthians. Corinthians, um, Corinthians 10 and 2. It says, and were all baptized to Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That this is New Testament, but the New Testament is clearly pointing to the Old Testament for the proper contextual structure and the reference point. It's making a reference point of the Old Testament. And if we go in other books of the New Testament, it also points out that um, not as Moses put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was of that which was abolished, and then it tells us furthermore in um second Corinthians three and fifteen it tells us, but even to this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart that so we're looking at Moses, but are we looking at Moses with the veil being removed or with the veil still being on our heart, so the Moshia Christ and his kingly character and the revelation of Christ is important to the proper understanding or overstanding of the Exodus. So the Messiah is still the key. Our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, just to show how New Testament connects with Old Testament. So when we find these areas in the New Testament, we know that Hawadi Apollos and, and the Messiah himself use the Old Testament as the point of reference. And the Old Testament is still the point of reference for even revelation revealing in the New Testament. This is looking at the big picture, looking at the vision. So right here where it says, this I say therefore, we're in Ephesians chapter 4 again. It says, this I say therefore and testify in Adonai, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. In other words, to even say the black Americans, how come the preachers didn't say this? And, 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 and I say this, I testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as the other so-called Americans walk. You see, the title of Gentile, it should not always be misunderstood that Gentile always means that these were white folks. Just like American doesn't always mean that it's white folks. You, you understand the context right there? It's very important because there were some who were scattered abroad even in such a time even as Paul himself had Roman citizenship. But it's clear that Paul, you know, I've heard some hypocritical um, mockers and scoffers, some of them your Afrocentric teachers, some of them, saying how Paul was a, you know, he was no Hebrew, he was a Roman or such and such, because he had Roman citizenship. And I'm thinking, this nigga who's talking, what citizenship does he have? He has American citizenship, but he's talking about Africa. He's talking about ancient Egypt. You don't know ancient Egyptian citizenship. He has American. So it's not properly it's like being children. Don't be children tossed to and fro, you know, by the wind of, 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 of doctrine, by the breeze of doctrine. But it, Paul is telling us here, Hawadio Paulos is saying that we should not walk as the other Gentiles walk. Like we're in the world, but we should not be of the world in the vanity of their mind in the vain things, their vain imaginations. Having the understanding darkened, their comprehension is darkened. Like many folks find it hard to accept the fact that the Israelites were black, that they were Ethiopian or Hebrew black folks, African folks, they were black. Some people think it's racist that to say that Christ, our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, was black. So they're, they're under, they can't even understand that. So their understanding is darkened. Their understanding is unilluminated, being alienated. They're alienated now from the life of God, from the true life of God by not being able to accept that true and historical, and we may say, because they made it a racial issue, that racial fact. You understand that Christ is black. You understand? So they are alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the what? The blindness, the blindness of their hearts, the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to the 
lasciviousness, lasciviousness. This is like the, the sensuality, the um, materialism that's going on today. Like what we see, just look at the news, watch TV, look around, look around, and that's what's going on today. They are past feeling, you understand? They've given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. This, these are the issues. These are, these are the issues in the, in, in the news. The, the uncleansiness, the lasciviousness, the greediness, the corruption. But ye, you all, have not so learned Christ. We're, this is not the, the Christ that we learn of in the King of Kings. You understand? This is not the Christ that we have learned of. If so be that ye have heard him. Have you heard him? Have you really listened to the teachings of his majesty and have been taught by him as the truth is in Yeshua, the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, the former behavior, the former way of life, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, just like for the Israelites being in Egypt, they had adopted a lot of the, the ways of society, you understand? And they had to, they had to um, pass through that Red Sea, like passing through the baptismal waters, you understand? And had to be clean, but because they were not willing, they wandered for 40 years, like our ancestors in the wilderness of North America. But it says, and be renewed. This is the point. We must be renewed in the what? Spirit of your mind. Not just renewing your mind, but be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, the new man. You understand? The neo. This is where we try to make a link with the matrix, the mother of the matrix, our sister Sophia Stewart, who is the real mind behind the real matrix, of course. This is just another example of things they've stolen from us and they don't give black folks any credit for. But it makes sense, really, when we look at the truth of it, that it would be a black mind behind even the matrix. You understand? Not just a black mind, but that's connecting even with this higher work, the work of God in Christ. So that Neo, that new man, which after God, which after God, I mean, Jah is first, we are after God, is what created, is created in righteousness and true holiness and true being set apart, set aside. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor. Now, it's interesting that of all the things it could say to do, why it mentions first putting away lying putting away lying, deceptives, deceitfulness, putting away lying, but speak every man the truth with his neighbor. Now, the neighbor, we have to understand this in the, in the first of all, the big picture of Beit Israel. We are all neighbors. We are all bread companions. It's not just talking about your next door neighbor, so to speak, but in this Egypt, because we're coming out, not staying in this reality. So we understand neighbor in the sense in the sense of in the sense of our brother and sister in Christ. Chiefly, for, you know, charity has to begin where at home and then spread abroad. So the the home for us, the first home, is that spiritual faith based home for us, right? For we are members one of another. See, that's what he's reminding us. We're members. It's not speaking of the world. He's, he's making a separation from the Gentiles. And the reason why we point this out, because a lot of folks in their Christianities, they have a, a, a poor hermeneutic, or um, it's not properly interpreted in the proper context. And much of even some of the best of white European Christianity kind of fall short on this point because they lie to themselves that they are the Beit Israel. They don't want to recognize that this people who they have brought from Africa to the Americas 400 plus years is that particular people and these particular judgments, you understand, are to come and we're moving 
rapidly into that time and that space, into that prophetic, that prophetic time and space. Yovas. Now, um, here it says, "Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath." In other words, be upset. But even even metaphysically, they're learning now that people who who keep these these negative emotions, these, these negative states of mind, how that wears them down as well. So we can look at this advice as Christian advice, but we can look at it as very practical, even metaphysical. Some We can call this, this, this was new age, when you really understand what Christ signified in what the Shua in his revelation day and time. And we're still in that dispensation spiritually so be angry but don't sin let not the sun go down upon your wrath so the sun going down so even the link with the sun not worshiping the sun but using the sun as a reference point is important neither give place to the devil don't give place to the devil don't be no devil's advocate don't give place to the devil let him that stole steal no more so for the ones who formerly in their old life, before they're born again in the King of Kings and his Christ, may have been thieves. You understand? So put away that. Don't steal no more. Ra but rather, let him labor. Let him work. Working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. So it's pointing out the virtue of working. It's pointing out how we should not steal. You understand? We should not steal, but let us labor. You understand? Labor in that which is good so that we will have even good to give others who need. You understand? So it shows that balance. It shows that balance, that ma'at, so to speak. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. So in this opening of the mouth, you understand? Let no corrupt communication, even for, 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 for many of us, and I don't know about what your, each of us may have different peculiar or particular um, shortcomings, right, as would be the case. But for some, to they, they live speaking corruptly for so long. So their cross is, is not to continue lying, not to continue speaking corruptly. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Whatever's more than that cometh of the evil one, our master say. But that which is good to the use of edifying, to use our communication to the use of building up. You know, sometimes somebody will say something, you just want to be like, like expletive, deleted, deleted you. You understand? Sometimes you resist that. Sometimes, you, you know, resist that right there. Resist the devil, in other words. You understand? Other cases, it might be necessary. So pray for wisdom. Pray for wisdom that it may minister grace to the hearers. Grace. The grace of God in Christ. The fact that, yes, we're living in perilous times, but there's good news. There's the good news of the King of Kings and his Christ, both for this life and for the life to come. The last three verses of this the walk of the Mitmanon as indwelt by the Spirit. That the walk of the faithful, there's an indwelling of the Spirit. You see, there's an indwelling of the Spirit. And grieve not the Memphis Kedus Ze Egeziabihir Lotus Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed to the day of redemption. That we're under a seal until that day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, with all malice. You see, we cannot put these things away just of ourselves because we know that. Yeah, that's, that sounds nice, but you all know sometimes that's what ones need, the spirit of Jah, you see, and one has to recognize the role of Christ, the role of Jesus Christos in the good news of the King of Kings and his Christ, in John Rastafari. That's, the, that's the, the, the stone which some of the builders may have refused, but it's still the ras or the head of 
the corner. Last verse, it says, and be ye kind, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, even as Jah, for Christ's sake, for the Moshiach's sake, hath forgiven you. This is, a, this, this is a whole new character. This is a new man. This is why the Israelites, many of them, they, they came out of Egypt, but they were not able to enter into the promised land, not that generation, because they, they did not have, they did not become, as it says right here, they did not um, become converted. They, they, the, 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 they didn't put off the former conversation of the old man. They still thought about Egypt, Egypt, Egypt. How was it like in Egypt? You understand? Oh, how I miss Egypt. It's the same reason. There was a, there was a, there, there, there's a bondage. So they may have left the physical land, but even moving towards the promised land, they still had that bondage mentality. You see, they still had that, that mentality within them. So they had come out physically, but their heart, their treasure was still in Egypt. It's the same today. Many might be talking about repatriation and going to Africa and Ethiopia and Shashimani, so forth and so on. But they haven't put off the former man. And if they haven't heard and received the King of Kings gospel, the good news of the King of Kings and his Christ, and if they haven't recognized the role of the Jesus Christos, our black Lord and Savior and their salvation, then they, they, they are not that new per They are not the right people. This explains what his majesty meant when he says, next time, send the right people. The right people who are not just physically prepared to come out. They just don't have a bag full, a pocket full of money or whatnot, but who are spiritually in heart and in mind prepared to come out and prepare to build and till and to prepare for the promised land. You see, it's a whole different mentality. You see, so when we keep preaching about being born again and, 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 and giving certain lessons from the scripture, it's not just that we know it and we're perfected. No, we are seeking to mature and perfect as well and to share what we have learned because we recognize the importance of it. So all this talk about repatriation, so forth and so on, until we get the divine heritage, and, and see, this brings us once again to the vision. This brings us to the vision, the big picture. This is the vision, the big picture. What's the big picture? Now, we pointed out this particular book here, The, the Believers or the Mitmanon's Guide to Spiritual Warfare. We pointed this out in some of the earlier videos by uh, Timothy B. White. It's a, it's, it's a small you know, book, you know, but it's, it has some basic, some basic keys in it that we find to actually um, far uh, outweigh other books which might be a little more uh, voluminous, you understand, but in this small book right here, for example, it says um, under a chapter, sub, sub chapter here, it speaks about the big picture as well, it says, Imagine Christ's agenda for the church prior to his second coming. So imagine, what do you think that Christ, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach's agenda was for the church? Now, we already know that there's pseudo-churches, counterfeit Christ, but all this, the Bible even tells us in itself. Revelation, when we talk about the seven churches, it's talking about seven different church ages. So if you look at Christianity from present time and trace it back to the founder of the firm, to Yeshua HaMoshiach, back to like um, pre-70 A.D., you will see these seven different dispensations, you know what I'm saying, of the church. And now we're in Laodicea. Laodicea is the seventh of these churches. And, and there's a video that I think we have available now. Um, it's called uh, it's Walter Viet, Walter Viet, and it's speaking of the seven churches. If you want to get a uh, more of a historical, contextual um, idea of 
what Revelation is speaking about with the seven churches, as well as accurate, some pretty accurate reference materials, we'll recommend that Walter Viet, um, Walter Viet uh, video, uh, seven churches, I think seven churches of Revelation. Now, Christ's agenda for the church prior to his second coming. And now the second coming really more correctly will, would be his, his appearance, his revelation, the revelation, his parousia, his revelation. No doubt he will purify his chosen to reflect his glory. Now, we're just going to read what they have here, and then we're going to give our own commentary on it. It says, no doubt he will purify his chosen to reflect his glory. He will surely test the fiber of our faith through trial. In the face of Satan's delusions, he might sovereignly restore supernatural grace and power to his people for a season of un unprecedented revival and harvest. We might also expect to see a special anointing on our young people, a hunger for the deeper things of the spirit. Now, um, this chapter, this, this, this paragraph here is interesting because let us think about that for a moment. This is the whole point of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was to reveal to Christ's people what must shortly come to pass. Let's look at this. We are still in RSS 14. We're still in, uh, we're going we're gonna to connect. Hopefully we'll, we'll be able to connect this and ones and ones will see why we found it necessary to touch on these and then come full circle with the big picture because we're going to touch on the plagues. We still want to touch on the plagues. The plagues is part of God's John's psychological, his own psyops against ancient Egypt. And if we look at some of the plagues, you know, there's been a lot of plagues already. And some of these plagues that have been going on already are very biblical and prophetic. And, but you have to also remember that because Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go, and also the Israelites were they would not listen to Moses. So we have the Israelites not listening to Moses. We have Pharaoh not willing to let the people go. Then we have nearly 10 plagues that had to come down in order to reveal the sovereignty of the God of the Hebrews and the, the lack of, the lack of, uh, the lack of sense of that Egypt, that particular Egypt. I know a lot of the, the black Afrocentric um, folks in Egypt, you know, who are caught up on some of the hype of ancient Egypt. Mm. They hate these kind of reasons. Men of them hate this kind of reason. They're saying the Bible, there was no Israelites. Of and then they'll say, well, the Israelites most likely were black. So were they Israelites or were they not Israelites? And, and by the way, who are you? And because people don't recognize who they are in the big picture, you know, so they can't see the vision of God. And the people that don't have the vision perish or they live loosely, like we currently as black folks are in this time when, you know, this, this is a crisis time. This is a real perilous and a crisis time. And it's just bound to get worse, just like it had to get for the Israelites and the Egyptians in order for both to recognize what really is going on. Because they were giving other excuses. Oh, the Nile River, it could be this or that. Oh, the frogs and, and, and this and the cattle. Oh, that's not it. You, you know what I mean? It had to be greater signs. Greater signs had to be demonstrated for Pharaoh. Pharaoh got stubborn. It's like white supremacy. White supremacy thinks like we gave you civil rights, we gave you affirmative action. What more do you want? Look, you got a black president. What more do you want? No, we don't. We don't want to even talk about slavery. We want to talk about that. They're being stubborn in the same sense. So great signs have to be revealed, but there also has to be messengers, the proclamation of it, telling them this is to happen because you keep being stubborn. 
you keep rejecting. You keep making your 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 ear close to the revelation of the King of Kings and His Christ. So there has to be a proclamation. But there's no proclamation that happens. They'll say, you can't say, oh, I, I knew it was going to happen, but I didn't say nothing. No, it has to be proclaimed first for it to then happen, for there to be no other um, possibility than the probability and the likelihood of divine intervention in human affairs. Now, Revelation chapter 1 begins like this. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to shew to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel, or his angel, to his servant John, who bear record of the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. So he bore witness of the word of God, one, the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach, and of all the things that he saw. So we must be a record and witness of the word of God, the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach, and of all the things that we see. So this shows the trifecta. You understand, of correspondence, of evidence. Two or three witnesses, every word is justified. But here's the key word right here, verse 3. It says, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, Many will say, well, this book is, what, 90, 92, some say 96, some say even 98 A.D. That, that, that's, that's, that's almost uh, 2,000 years ago. You understand? It's a time is at hand. But now when you are able to rightly, hermeneutically interpret the scriptures, you will see that it that those things were coming to pass. It, it, there's an order to the, to the manifestation of prophecy. Now, one of the big signs for us is Rastafari, is Ethiopia, is the Lateran Treaty, um, is the coronation of Haile Selassie, is the invasion of Ethiopia, is World War, both one, World War Two. you understand, is, is the period of time between then and um, 1961, the OAU, Yovas, there's also the signs and links for us with Shashimani as our foothold. There's that 40-year period, the civil rights movement, coming up to even 2000 or the World Trade Center bombing, as well as the election of the first so-called African-American president. And when we touched on chronology before, we didn't point this out, but isn't it interesting that this is 2012, right? Well, 2012, right, is, is so-called A.D., is the Western calendar. And the Ethiopic calendar is 75.04 a.m. Now, a.m. means Ameta Nehiret, which means the year of mercy. Mm -hmm. But if we then interpret this according to the, the Western the Western um, correspondence of it, we have 2004. So we're really more in 2004 a.m. This, let's correct this, this will be EC. This will be the long calendar, the Ethiopic long calendar right here, the Ethiopic 7504. So we're 2004, right? You notice the difference right there? How, how, many, how many years? There's about an eight-year difference. Now, this, this eight-year difference has a lot of uh, significance. There's a lot of different um, evidence we can point out, but we'll point out something that's, that's a little bit closer to, closer to home, closer to modern times. Let's look at the Twin Towers bombing, right? Everybody says that, well, let's look at the Western New Year. It was 2000, right? The Western New Year 
right? The, the Western is the new year, right? The Western new year, or some say the new millennium, was 2000, right? But Ethiopically, the Western new year was 2007. Now, Ethiopian calendar has an older and a more accurate testimony to both past and present events. So if we were to trust any of these calculations, we should trust the Ethiopic calculation of 2007. Now, remember, it's about an eight year. So we can have this 2007, 2008. If we look at 2007, 2008, the more significant thing than the Twin Towers bombing, which was a, a great tragedy in, in, in and of itself, but was the election of Barack Obama actually, as well as 2008 witnessed the, the economic crash, where they said this was the most significant crash of the global economic system since the stock market crash. Now, the stock market crash and the rise of His Majesty and the revelation of Haile Selassie is also significant as well because the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s is a significant time and much of Revelation. There's a portion of Revelation which is actually a symbolic um, testimony of that particular period of time. So we, you need to understand that when you are looking at history, but history and history channel always avoids the Ethiopian testimony of that. So they give us the OJs, the other Jews, so forth and so on. But if we put it into proper context, which is this chronology here, it becomes very clear what we're dealing with. So if we look at 2012, let's look at 2012 for a moment. If we look at 2012, Ethiopically, when would 2012 be? Ethiopically, 2012 will be 2019 or basically 2020. Now they say 2020 is good vision. If you have 2020, you understand we had so-called 2020, not quite 2020 now. You understand, but 2020 is, is good vision. So 2020, according to the Western AD calendar, would actually be 2012. So when they're telling us about this uh, December 21st date, it's interesting. Is it the day, that particular date, or are we in a particular time period? Now, Revelation chapter 11 that we touched on before for Sodom and um, spiritual Sodom in Egypt, it says something interesting there in the spiritual Sodom and Egypt in that particular chapter. Let's just go here for a moment and refresh. Um, okay, 42 months. There's a 42 months period of time because 42 months is roughly three and one half years. Three and one half years is a period of seven years cut in half. Now, many of the European and other Christian um, Bible uh, scholars and prophecy scholars, they, they point out that in the last days before the great and, and the dreadful day of the Lord, that there would be this, um, this treaty made by the so-called Antichrist of Israel for a period of a, a seven-year treaty. But in the middle of this seven-year treaty, you understand, at the period of three and a half years, there would be something striking, uh, you know, connection. Different, different Bible folks interpret it a little bit differently. But they're pointing to certain things such as the 40 and 2 months and other usages, for example, 1,260 days, or in the Lateran Treaty, 1,260 years. That was the period of time that, that the Pope of Rome lost his authority as king, and that was restored under Benito Mussolini, whom many, even in, in, in the 1920s and 30s, they recognized that he was an antichrist. There's a history program, Antichrist Part 1 and Part 2. Uh, I think they touch on it there. You know how Mussolini was even thought to be an antichrist. But what's interesting that they suppressed and kept from the viewer was what was going on in Ethiopia and 
the King of Kings and that biblical connection, because if we would put that into context, so what we have presently, the majority of biblical mumbo-jumbo about the Bible, some of it is accurate, some of it is true, but a lot of it is extremely skewed because they are maliciously and deliberately avoiding the Ethiopian testimony, as though Ethiopians are not Christians, were not ancient Christians, and not hold the faith, and as, as though it's a white thing, and the black thing is, it doesn't even deserve any serious consideration in their particular school of thought. That's very dangerous. That is very dangerous, and we think that this whole 2012 thing is also very dangerous, too, because the half of the story that's being avoided and suppressed and not even being addressed but we think that there's, there's going to be a seven to eight year period between 2012 and the real total collapse of this system of things. So even though they project themselves past 2020, um, based on the biblical um, revelation and based upon the, the signs, what we see, and what we are able to connect with the Bible, that is the most likely and logical time frame. Although it doesn't, it can be a shorter time frame. It can be even a longer time frame. You see, because most of that is determined really by God's people. You understand, and by I and I, and what also we do. I mean, we can allow our persecution to go on if we if we choose it. So this is why there was no fixed time given to prophetical. Uh, you know, the prophetical word. They were time, but they wouldn't say on this date, so forth and so on. But what we're putting here is just a sample of the difference in calculation from biblical times or from so-called A.D. Remember, there was no zero year either. So think about it, there was no zero year. Really, 2007 in the Western you understand, know, would have been actually probably 2006. So you get to see there's a lot of overlapping inconsistencies with the Eurocentric timekeeping. In fact, most of our time and ideas of time are skewed, horribly skewed, especially if we're going to look at certain things biblically in the sense of prophetic timekeeping. So we got to look at the big picture, basically. So we see that Christ's agenda from the church prior to his revelation, even the revelation of Rastafari, was a purification of his chosen ones in order for them to reflect his glory. The amazing thing is that the people of the 19, say, the black folks of the past, it seems as though they were in a different glory than black people today. I mean, it's not just black and white footage or whatever. There was just a different, it seemed like a different nature even the Christianity of our ancestors, just going back maybe 80 or so years, 70 to 80 years, was vastly different. If we look at the black church, the Negro church, something has changed. But that generation was a special generation because that generation, more than any other, was reflecting and in the reflection of the glory of the King of Kings, of Christ in his kingly character. So this word here also is, is, is true. He will surely test the fiber of our faith through trial. We can see that within the last 40 or so years and even many of our present um, spiritual and temporal um, um, warfare. You understand much of what many of us are going through spiritually and in the world and the men and people mixed up moods and attitudes and other things is also a part of that testing of the fiber of our faith. Remember Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, where it says, till we all come in the unity, in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, the Bain Ha Elohim. In the face of Satan's delusions, and this is another area, a lot of the delusions, seeing the big picture all this New World Order kind of talk, Illuminati, Freemasons. There's truth to that, but there is a delusion that there is nothing one can spiritually do about it. And that is, that's part of the, it's almost like it's a fate accompli. 
Like it's an accomplished fact. Most folks have this idea of New World or Illuminati, Freemason, uh, a continual white supremacy, and, and blackface too. You know what I'm saying? Is, you know, nothing you can do about it. That's, that's what most folks think, which is a part of the overall delusion of Satan. It says that the Most High might sovereignly, sovereignly restore, restore supernatural grace and power to his people for a season of unprecedented revival and harvest. Now, when we look at the Rastafari movement, we've mentioned that for, it seems like, almost 40 years, much of the movement since the assassination and murders of, of the martyrdom of many of the leading Rastafari brothers and sisters, the movement has turned into an inertia. So this unexpected, um, or unprecedented, this, this season, we should be looking forward and preparing for this particular season. And this is where the, the Hebrew holy days, even Fasica, Passover is very important. Recall the verse, if you will, um, Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 7 and 8. And remember, Passover, Pesach is coming up. So no longer would they say, this prophetic people, uh, Jah live, the Lord live, which brought up uh, the children of Israel out of Egypt, but they will say that Jah live, which brought up the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, even North America, and all of the countries in which he had driven us, in which we were scattered under that particular dispensation, known as slavery and um, so forth and so on. Now, um, the author here says that he believes, and we also have faith that, that Jah is preparing committed servants to meet the challenges. Now, he wrote this in the 1990s. This is interesting, of the 1990s. But we still are in a time where we need committed servants of the King of Kings and co-laborers in this ministry to meet the challenges even of 2012. He is restoring the fullness of his grace, his gifts, wisdom, and authority required to face a foe who knows his time is short. See, maybe we don't know really what time we're in, but the devil, Satan, and his men and people, they know that their time is short. This is why we see an increase in the flood of ungodliness and ungodly waters. You understand? They know their time is short and whose wrath is now being unleashed. So if we count from the 90s to this present time, this is nearly 20 years. Now we're at a particular door of, of, um, a door of prophecy. One aspect of Adonai's agenda, or the Lord's agenda for the church, is for his people to understand spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare, to learn, to detect, and to deal with the subtleties of Satan, the subtleties of Satan. Overtly, we face a flood of immorality, violence, and a vast array of behaviors destructive to human dignity. Covertly, we find seemingly endless psycho-spiritual Groups that deny the gospel, that deny the wind, that deny the good news of the King of Kings and his Christ. And they deify humanity. Really, they, they, they deify um, human beings who are projecting Satanistic world concepts. But that's, uh, that's part of the spiritual Egypt um, the category of this study, the spiritual Egypt, because we want to touch on the, the plagues and how the plagues against Egypt was really against all the gods, all the gods of the Egyptians, which are still, ironically, the same gods in principle of this system, this present world system. 
and the God of this world, which is this, the, the God we're talking about, the God of this world, promotes these, these whitewash um, cultural values that glorify greed and idolize, they idolize the pursuit of personal pleasure, and, and not just personal pleasure, but immoral personal so-called pleasures. What is the child of light? What are we as children of the true light, of the true illuminator, the king of kings and his Christ? What are we to do? That's the question. What do we do? Too often, the church, and by extension, those who say they're spiritual or Christian, so forth and so on, the church is reactive in responding to this flood. They are reactive, not proactive. But the role of the redeemed, if we are the redeemed, is to be courageously as the lion of the tribe of Judah, as the king of kings has so demonstrated, proactive in devising and implementing strategies that penetrate and weaken the influence of evil. Now, this particular point here, we had to highlight that that. that sentence there. The role of the redeemed is to be courageously proactive, not reactive. Proactive at what? In devising and implementing strategies that penetrate and weaken and weaken the influence of evil. Now, Satan, what does Satan want? Some would say, who cares? But in the spiritual warfare, it's important for us to know that Satan, may be cursed, wants to divert people from Christ himself. They want to divert people from Christ, Yeshua himself. And when we say from Christ, from the teaching, from the true word of Christ, from the true logic, the logos of Christ, the reality of Christ. Even now, Satan Yehun is motivated by pride and jealousy. And this pride and jealousy it prompted his initial the initial rebellion, which some reference to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter fourteen, verses twelve to fourteen and and Ezekiel chapter twenty eight, verses eleven to nineteen. So it should be no mystery, no secret, that at some point, Jah, at some point, the true God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, will allow his adversary to construct a, quote, powerful delusion, to construct a powerful delusion. We've touched on this even in the popery, some of the recent popery um, vids, um, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 11. And these, the, the, this, this, this powerful delusion is going to be accompanied by supernatural signs and wonders. Now, whether this is the harp, you know about harp, you heard about harp, whether it's the harp affecting the weather, and people thinking, oh, God did it, but acts as man temp tampering with the atmosphere, or whether it's some kind of some kind of the light shows out there where they say this might be aliens or something like that. Maybe that's part of the supernatural signs and wonders. But all these are designed to deceive and bring damnation to all who refuse to embrace the truth. This is the key. That it's it's not as though just people are being cursed and, you know, for no reason, and people are going to be destroyed and, and there's tribulation for no reason. But it points out that the, the, the damnation, the destruction of this mystery Babylon, this spiritual Egypt and Sodom, you understand, is for all who refuse to embrace the truth. This means that the truth must also have an opportunity and perhaps this internet and this technology now is perhaps an opportunity since they're trying to lock down and crack down on the internet. There's a big protest and the Google and the Wikipedia 
th- those people fought back and you know and so they so they they put it on hold for a moment but they want to crack down on the internet because they say it's because of quote piracy but the more logical reason is too much stuff can get out there and people you know their consciousness now they're becoming more conscious of of the half of the story and they're, they're questioning things and they're not so so easily controllable although they're still in the matrix so they want to crack down on that as well but there must be a time when truth is allowed to speak clearly when 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 ones have an opportunity to decide for or against the truth of the king of kings and his christ and and we we be thinks you know that this time is one of those times, extraordinary time, even for the message of Rastafari, even for the ability to communicate and to, to reach so many ones with the half of the story. This, is, this, this was never before. And even adjusting to this so-called new normal, new reality, it takes, it takes some, some, um, some work you know, some thought and some work. But one modern example of Satan's work is the so-called New Age movement. Not that the New Age is not the New Age, but Satan is trying to commandeer and hijack, and so far with the zeitgeist and with a lot of other um, psychobabble out there, has done pretty well in hijacking the so-called New Age for satanic purposes, where most people, when they hear New Age, they think New Age means that Satan is at the controls. They don't recognize that the true New Age was of the King, is of the King of Kings and His Christ. But this this delusion that has a powerful delusion, which will affect and deceive all peoples, not just localized people here or there, but all peoples. But the Almighty still has has his has his will you understand his will but he's allowing these things now this is supposedly this satanic work or the satanic version the satanic version of the new the new age is supposed to usher in a new order of peace and harmony but they don't tell you openly but it's under so-called satanistic or luciferian principles not under the principles or teaching of the king of kings and his christ they sought to take that over in essence the schemes of evil remain boringly 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 the same and this is what you really have to get that when you watch as many of these vids about the new age secret society illuminati and you get to the 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 crux of the truth about it you know from all the different presentations you begin to recognize and look over history you, you begin to see how it, it's it's boringly the same you know they, they're doing the same thing but packaging their conspiracy a little bit different when you get to the root principles all the changes is the package knowledge power and so-called uh, self-deification were the very temptations of Aden, of the Eden. Now, here is the challenge to the church, and here is the challenge to us as the Society of His Majesty and as the Rastafari Church of the King of Kings and His Christ. Those who are awake and alert in Christ, those who are awake and alert in Christ, endowed with discernment, the ability to be discerning and wisdom, must recognize that the arch enemy of Christos, uh, Christos Takawami, is staging a strategic move. So what we've been witnessing, especially since 9-11, you know, since 9-11 is the Ethiopian New Year. You understand? So 9-11 is Ethiopian New Year, and yet nothing about Ethiopia has really been put into, you know, has been suppressed from from you know history channel and i mean they give little little bird seeds you know little chewed and spit out bird seeds but they but they suppress a lot from it that this whole 911 thing we see this as being the strategic move of satan 
and of his human um, accomplices of Satana to deceive and destroy people, to deceive and to destroy people in, in heart, in mind, and ultimately, ultimately physically. You understand? The role of the redeemed, we as the redeemed of the King of Kings and his Christ, our role, our responsibility is to wake up, is to wake up is to sound a call to arms and to actively wage war, actively wage war against the schemes in the name and the power of our God and Father of our Black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, Jesus Christos. Now, here's a point we want to point out as well, too, which we thought in this in this one sub-chapter was interesting that we share, our purpose is not to prevent the final manifestation of evil. See, some folks think, oh, let's stop the Illuminati, let's stop the Satanists, let's stop the Luciferian. What? Where, where, where are you getting your marching orders from? Our purpose is not to prevent this final manifestation of evil. Why? Because it's allowed by our God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. It, it's, it's scripturally, it's allowed. You understand? But it's not, it's not a threat to I and I if I and I are born again. You understand? If I and I are growing up to him in all things, if I and I are learning and acting on the knowledge, learning and doing the truth, it's not a threat to I and I. But this final manifestation this end time manifestation or powerful delusion has been allowed by the sovereign God and Father. Now, our purpose is redemptive. You understand? Our purpose is about the redemption. Even the black Beta Israel redemption, just like Bob Marley, Burhana Selassie sung it, the black redemption. That's what our purpose is. And then from the true Beta Israel, therefore a door is now open to even the righteous among the Gentiles of all nations. But see, there's an order to the Father's house. There's a particular order. This is why he doesn't exclusively just deal with us because we're black, but we have a particular role and responsibility to him. You understand to him and even by making our wills obedient to his purpose, it helps the other, it blesses other peoples and other nations, even the Gentiles and even white folks too. But we must, first of all, put, put things in their proper order, you understand, and recognize his order is our order and his will should be our will to fulfill. Our purpose is redemptive to allow the Memphis Kedus, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to wrench people free, to snatch people free, to cut people free, you understand, from the sneers of Ha Shaitan's deception. That's what our purpose is about. It's, it's not to prevent, you know, the, 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 the final manifestation of evil or the so-called... Um, the fraudulent New World Order, whatnot. No. Those things are for a time. Those things are allowed. And part of our unity of, of faith is that that does not bother us. Part of our knowledge of the Son of God keeps us in a corporate structure, in the family and the body of Christ. And it builds us and it edifies us. And we become a blessing, you understand, for those other tribes and nations and peoples who even if they've fallen under this this deception, they begin to catch their 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 senses and and want to come out. So we have a very important role and responsibility, brothers and sisters. There's a very important role and responsibility. So I wanted to share this is another a couple of these things over the last couple of days. Um you know, um, this is when it comes to spiritual warfare, most Christians aren't concerned about the cosmic, but the hassles of daily life. Like for most, for most of y'all, you'll be like, well, your warfare is just what you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day 
bases. And this is on another section called hand-to-hand -hand combat. But we'll take one matter at a time. First of all, just reminding ones and want to deal with this. What, what is the big, what's really the big picture in Rastafari revelation? What's the really big picture for us as Ethiopian Hebrews? And this is the attempt to present some of, some of the chronology here because we see actually 2012 as, as, a, as a door, as, as a start point. Even when the Bible says, when you shall see this and that, wars and rumors of wars, as there's wars and rumors of wars right now, will America attack Iran? Will Israel attack Iran? Will the Russians and the Chinese come to the, to, you know, the support of the Syrians or the Iranians? Will this all bubble up and what kind of a global kind of a thing? So we, we got these wars and, and, and rumors of wars, but the Bible tells us, the, the testimony of Yeshua tells us that, and when we will see these things, it is only the beginning, only the beginning. So it seems as though a lot of this is coming to a head in this 2012 period, starting a beginning of a perhaps a seven, a seven year, the eighth year will be the summation, the culmination of it, um, a, a seven year period of time. And we wanted to point this out because a lot of folks might think when we're talking about 2012, we're saying it's all going to happen on that day. Or, no, that day, that time, this time we're moving in, it's like a doorway. It's like there's an there's a, there's a opening of a particular consciousness. You know what I'm saying? But it will 